Practice makes perfect and practice makes permanent. These are sayings that I've gathered through the, through the years with people that I meet. You know, my best, my best teachers are the students. In fact, I came to the conclusion that the best way to learn is to teach. So when I'm reading something, I'm reading some new principles, some things I didn't know, I tell my husband. And he says, that doesn't make sense. So then I go back to the books. <laughs> and then I try again. In this lecture today, we're going to be looking at the first few laws of health. In the little book, Ministry of Healing, page 127, Ellen White says, pure air, sunshine, abstemishness or temperance, rest, exercise, proper diet, use of water, trust in divine power. These are the true remedies. So let's look at those true remedies. And the first one we're going to have a look at is pure air. Notice it's not just air, it's pure air. And here at Living Springs, I think you'll agree that we specialize in pure air, the best of air. There are so many beautiful evergreen trees around there. And I think you realize those evergreen trees are, are giving off oxygen. And that's what oxygen contains for it to be so essential for our life, is oxygen. Where are... Um, the, the part of our body, it's, it's actually every part of our body, requires oxygen. And as we looked at yesterday, and I'll show you that again today, going inside the cell, which is the CBD of the human body. So yesterday we went inside and we looked at the journey of the glucose. We touched what happens with oxygen. But I want to pursue that a little bit more today. Remember the glucose goes in? It goes through a 20-step pathway, and the 20-step pathway delivers to us two units of energy. The end result of the 20-step pathway is a chemical form of glucose called pyruvate. And pyruvate, as the chemical form of glucose, gets fed into the next part of the cell. It's called the powerhouse of the cell. This is the mitochondria, specifically inside the Krebs cycle which has an eight-step pathway, but that gives us 36 units of energy. And as we looked at yesterday, this pathway, no oxygen. So it produces energy by the process of fermentation, whereas the eight-step pathway, it uses oxygen. What a difference oxygen makes. Mm -hmm. And it's because of this fact that, that we understand the statement that you will receive more energy than you expend on your morning walk. And I also showed you the other day how right now you're breathing in 500 mil and you're breathing out 500 mil. But when you got to the top of that hill, did the twins take you what to a hill this morning? Mm -hmm. When you got to the top of the hill and you're starting to breathe like this, you're breathing in 3,600 mil of air and you're breathing out 3,600 mil basically of waste because the combustion of oxygen and glucose at the cellular level gives off carbon dioxide and that is another gas. So when we breathe in, there are little tiny alveoli, they're like little sacs at the end of each bronchial in our, in our lungs. And over, I'll magnify it for you, over that little alveoli is a, a network of capillaries. They're your blood capillaries. So when we breathe in, the oxygen's coming in here, the oxygen goes into the little alveoli, the blood drops the carbon dioxide and picks up the oxygen. It's quite a fascinating process. So then we breathe out the carbon dioxide. Now, every few years we have to do the um, first aid course. I think no matter where you, you live, you have to do first aid courses. And we used to learn um, mouth to mouth resuscitation, yeah? Well, they don't do that anymore. <laughs> And they don't do that anymore for a few reasons, because when you're breathing in, you are breathing a little bit of oxygen, but not a lot. You're actually breathing quite a bit of carbon dioxide. They recognize now that pumping the, the chest is, is more effective. So that, that's where it all happens 
is right down there. So how many of these do we have? We've got about 300 million <laughs> alveoli in our lungs and that's where the gaseous exchange takes place. What I want to do in this lecture is show you how you can ensure you're getting optimum amounts of oxygen and how you can prevent anything that would inhibit you taking up the oxygen. But let's first of all make a list of all the things that oxygen does. So what's the effect of oxygen on the body? It invigorates. I don't know whether you've heard of uh, Wim Hof. Wim Hof is a, a man, yeah, there's a few nods. He, um, he uses breathing to control basically temperature, many things that's happening in his body. And he climbs Himalayan mountains in the snow in shorts and t-shirt. And he's got this method of breathing. It's breathing. And taking in more oxygen invigorates you. Yes, it also, um, to the point where it can electrify the cells. That's how you're going to feel when every cell has enough oxygen to be able to give that sort of energy. It also soothes the nerves. Mm. We had a, a girl do our, one of our programs and she was about 35 and on her wrist she'd tattooed just breathe. Now, I'm not suggesting we tattoo just breathe, <laughs> I'm giving it as an illustration. She said that she learnt the Wim Hof method of breathing, which is breathing very quickly and very deeply and letting out, and she conquered her panic attacks. So whenever she'd feel a bit panicky, she'd do the deep breathing. And she said she even got off all her medication. Now, how simple is that? That's a very simple thing to do. You know, it's a great thing to teach children because this is a skill that they can take through their whole life. I'll tell you what my son Peter does to my little granddaughter, Sophia. Not so much now, but when she was three, you know what little three-year-olds are like? Sometimes it's, I don't want to wear that dress and I don't want to eat that. And I... So Peter would take her hands, he'd sit down in front of her and he'd say, now breathe. And she'd have to go, one, two, three, four. And if she got to four and went, I don't want to breathe anymore, he'd say, we'll start again. And she knew that there was only one way out of this and that was breathing. One, two. When she got to 10, he'd say, would you like to breathe again? And if she'd say, no, then they'd start all over again. And if she'd say, yes, Daddy, and she had to smile, they'd do 10 more, breath, 10 more breaths, and then he'd say to her, have you got something to say to me? And she'd say, this is three, thank you for regulating my emotions, Daddy. <laughs> and he'd say, you're welcome, and off she'd go. <laughs> now, let's say a few hours later, he hears an irritated word, he would say, do we need to breathe? No, Daddy, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right, Daddy. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Such a simple thing. Now, my daughter said they were at a function and a little two-year-old was being difficult. So my granddaughter, Sophia, goes up to her and says, breathe, breathe, <laughs> three, and she's teaching. Now, can you see what Peter has taught his little girl? how to manage those irritations that come to us every day, is that right? So whenever you're feeling irritated, remember Peter and Sophia. Breathe, breathe, it's oxygen, because we've got one trillion brain cells. And when those brain cells have enough oxygen, what's it gonna do? Sorry, I forgot a very important uh, letter there. <laughs> it soothes nerves, all the nerves. But let's have a look at the effect of no oxygen. It's called hypoxia. Hypoxia is a medical condition. It's actually a dangerous condition. It's lack of oxygen at the cellular level. And it can get to the point of death. But there are many people who are suffering from hypoxia, but they're not to the blue lip stage. They're not on death's door. These are some of the symptoms. Fatigue. feel like they've climbed a mountain and all they've done is got out of bed. Lethargy, can't even get out of bed. Nausea, the little cells that make up the stomach don't have enough oxygen and when they don't have enough oxygen, they're not producing enough enzymes to break down your food. Headache, the brain cells don't have enough oxygen. 
I meet many people today that are drifting in that haze that lies between optimum health and severe illness. Do you find that? They're not jumping out of their skin with energy. They're not bedridden. They're just, Ooh. And if you say, how are you? What's the answer? Oh, not too bad. What's not too bad? Not too good. <laughs> how many people, when you meet them and you say, how are you? Say, fantastic. You'd go, what are they on? <laughs> What are they on? Don't you think that's sad that we've come to a time on planet Earth when the only people jumping out of their skin are the people on something? And when the people that are on something, when that eases off or wears off, where are they now? <laughs> I believe that God meant us human beings to feel good every day, every moment. Is that right? Absolute life, life should be very good. And if it's not very good, we've got to put our detective hat on and find out why isn't life very good? Is it because we are lacking oxygen? Now I want to show you two types of air that greatly influence the uptake of oxygen in our body. One type of air is alive with negative ions. Negative ions are electrically charged oxygen molecules. Where do you find them? Well, let me show you how they're made. Water droplets pass through the air, casting off negative ions. I memorise that. I like to get it straight from the horse's mouth. So let's have a look. Three things have to be present. Water droplets pass through the air. Pass, there's movement, casting off negative ions. So we've got to have movement, moisture and air. Whenever you've got movement, moisture and air, you've got the production of negative ions. If you've got a lot of moisture but not a lot of movement or air, what have you got growing there now? Mould, that's right. So moisture, movement and air. Where do we find moisture, movement and air? The thunderstorm. And I think we can all identify with the smell of the air when the thunderstorm hits. It's lovely, isn't it? I sometimes get that smell when I'm watering my garden. Because when I'm watering my garden, what have I got? Moisture, movement and air. Also the ocean waves. The ocean waves pounding against the, the rocks is creating those negative ions. Also the waterfalls. All forests are higher in negative ions than when there's no forest. Because remember what those leaves are doing, they're giving off oxygen. But there is a type of tree that gives off more, and that's the pine. Because the pine needles are so numerous. So with pine needles, you get a huge surface area, giving off moisture, giving off oxygen. And you only have to get the slightest breath of wind, and you get those needles moving. Just, fr just not far from the front of my house, I have some big pine trees, and I love the sound of the wind in the pine trees almost sounds like rushing water. And when my little grandchildren are with me, I say, listen, listen to the wind in the pine trees. On the other hand, we've got positive ions. We're referring to the negative charge and the positive charge here. Remember that positive ions are positively bad for you because po positive ions have more carbon dioxide in their molecule than oxygen. Where do you find them? Before the thunderstorm. Don't we often comment, I think a storm's coming, the air's heavy with positive ions. The city. So we've got a few things happening in the city that's contributing to the positive ions. One is we've got a lot of people. There's not a lot of forests in the city, is there? <laughs> we've got a lot of people and they're all giving out carbon dioxide, but some of those people are breathing out carbon monoxide because they are smoking. Carbon monoxide is found in, is, is given off from uh, cigarette smoke. So the purple person smoking it and also the passive smokers are getting that carbon monoxide. You also find cars giving off carbon monoxide. And because of the high buildings and not a lot of sun getting right down in there, you've also got mould growth, especially where there's rubbish build up in those back streets. 
I know at the moment that uh, there's been quite a few deaths in India from COVID. You've probably seen that. But have you ever been to India? The, the filth. There's just filth everywhere. So you've got a lot of mould. You haven't got a lot of pure air. And I was talking to one lady that works with them. She said, oh, they're terrible for drinking water. It's actually been a disaster waiting to happen. And if it wasn't COVID, it would have been something else. Let's have a look at carbon monoxide. Because carbon monoxide is the enemy of oxygen, and I'll show you why. So carbon monoxide, when it's breathed in, it forms a very tight union on the blood cell. But when oxygen's breathed in, it forms a very unstable union, very loose. And the reason for that is when that blood cell is going through our body, it can drop the oxygen quickly wherever it is needed. So if someone's breathing in carbon monoxide and oxygen, can you see the, the monoxide's going to grab it first? Because it forms a very tight union. And that explains why if you go to a hospital ward where limbs are being amputated, it's usually smokers. Because by the time the blood gets to the extremities, there's no oxygen left. And if, remember, it's the most vital element needed for life. When those, when those extremities are lacking oxygen, basically they start to die. Something else can affect, and that is hydration. You would never think of hydration when you're thinking of oxygen. But under a microscope, blood cells look like this. They're moving around. They're moving it around at an incredible rate. But if someone's dehydrated, the blood cells clump. It's actually called roulette. Now, when those blood cells go through the lungs, they pick up oxygen like little parcels. When this goes through the lungs, how much oxygen is it picking up? Can you see that someone can suffer from chronic fatigue syndrome? And of course, that's what lack of oxygen is called. Isn't that right? Chronic fatigue syndrome. All a person with chronic fatigue syndrome needs is more oxygen. Now, there can be a hundred reasons why there is lack of oxygen. We've just looked at some of them. And one is dehydration. If you ask the person with chronic fatigue syndrome, do they exercise, what's the answer? Oh, you, you don't understand. I've just got no energy. Well, guess how you get it? <laughs> you, you, you actually start moving. That's what you've got to do. I would say in nine cases out of 10 of people that have come to our retreats with chronic fatigue syndrome, I find a mold factor. You see, when a person's breathing in mold, they're not getting enough ex oxygen, so a lot of their cells, where are they running? Mm -hmm. Up at two units of energy. That's why the detective hat has to be put on and find out why these things are so. Also, something that can affect chronic fatigue syndrome is animals in the home. Because animals are not giving off pure air. <laughs> and especially when they are meat eaters, and most animals in the home are meat eaters, isn't that right? Which is your cats and your dogs. What they give off is not a, is not a nice air. And also the hair that they leave in the carpets, on the lounges. We were looking at a lady's blood slide. This is about five years ago now doing the live blood analysis and we saw a little parasite. We've actually saw two through the blood and we're, we're zooming around on the microscope. And we said to this lady, do you, do you have any animals in your home? She said, I sleep with four cats every night. And we said, well, look what they've done to you. <laughs> look what they've given you. So animals really should be kept outside or they should be kept in, in tiled areas, definitely not in the bedrooms, because that interferes with the air that you're breathing while you're sleeping. Please begin to investigate your, your bed. How old is your mattress? Do you have a mattress protector on it? Is that washed every few months? Does your pillow, look where your pillow is, it's right where your face is. Every pillow should have a pillow protector on it. If you don't have a pillow protector on it, maybe you should buy a new pillow every year. 
especially feather. I love feather. It's a natural fibre, but every night we lose moisture and the feathers take it in. So the feather pillows and quilts should be regularly sunned and ideally washed every couple of years. So yes, it's time to get clotheslines and put them out. The sun purifies, the sun penetrates very deep. So investigate your sleeping area because you spend a third of your life in that room and that can interfere with your oxygen uptake. Also, posture. Why posture? Well, your, your uh, muscles in your abdominal area are all connected to your spine. So when they are loose, the posture tends to be like this. But when the abdominal muscles are strong, that automatically helps to pull your spine back. And your abdominal muscles were designed to aid in the breathing process. Many people are high chest breathers today. They're only breathing with their high chest because their abdominal muscles are weak and they don't have good posture. So it's important to stand tall, that erect form, where sons and daughters, princes and princesses of the most high God. So, so stand as the prince and the princess that you are and make sure you strengthen those abdominal muscles. If you're only breathing with your high chest, sometimes you're only getting maybe a third or half the amount of oxygen that you should be getting. The Framingham Heart Study, interesting study, I think I mentioned it the other day, they found that by the age of 50, most people had lost 40% lung capacity. By the age of 80, most had lost 60% lung capacity. How would they do that? They stop using those lungs. They start sitting like this. They become high chest breathers. They're not exercising. How can you retain it? Run up and down those hills every day. Strengthen your abdominal muscles. Do your push-ups every day. Do your core strengthening exercises every day and breathe deeply and make sure those windows are open, especially while you're sleeping. So you can prevent uh, the loss of that lung capacity if you do that. And if you have lost that lung capacity, you can regain it by exercising it. And how do you exercise it? Breathing very, very deeply. So what we have done here is we have explored many ways that you can ensure that you're getting adequate oxygen. I know when I was homeschooling my children and the long division was getting difficult and I found the children when they're not, you know, when they're not getting something, they can even be difficult to work with, they're feeling bad, so I'd call a break. Okay, skipping rope, trampoline, run around the house three times, get on your bike. They'd come back ten minutes later like this. <sighs> can you see the face? Mm -hmm. And well, they'd get it. <laughs> So when you are studying, and hopefully you all are studying, we should be learning new things every single day. Remember to take little breaks and get on that rebound or that exercise bike or run around the house or run up a hill and get replenish those brain cells with the oxygen so that you can learn new things. We should be learning new things right up until the, until the day we die. So you can see why oxygen is the most vital element needed for life. I do acknowledge that there are some areas where you have to wear a mask. So please make sure it's a cotton mask and please make sure that you can wash it and you must wash it every day because you're breathing out the waste and it gets stuck in those little fibers. Mm -hmm. Try and get a, as a looser cotton one as, as you can and as soon as you're out of that shop, <laughs> take that mask on and get the fresh air. And please don't put your children in a mask because you know children aren't getting COVID. <laughs> it's the elderly who are getting it because those children need that fresh air. The second law of health is sunshine. God didn't make a mistake when he put the sun in the sky. But we are not going to look at sunshine right now. We're going to look at that after the break. What I want to look at now is the third law of health, which is temperance. Temperance means not taking anything into the body that will harm it and taking in moderation the good things. 
So notice there are two things there. That's the dictionary definition of temperance. Number one is there are some things that should not enter and the other is taking in moderation the good things. So basically all good things. Some people say moderation in all things. You would never say moderation in cyanide or arsenic. No, there are some things that should never be taken into the body, but all the good things should be done in moderation. All play and no work makes Jack a very poor boy, and all work and no play makes Jack a very dull boy, aren't they the old sayings? It surprises me that we've come to a time on planet Earth where adults don't include children in the work of the home. Have you found that? Mm -hmm. I was reading of a uh, British paediatrician. He came to Australia. He said, I thought the slave trade was abolished. He said, it's alive and well in Australia. It's called mother. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. We had a young girl... She came to help while her mother did the program. She was 15. She was totally useless. She couldn't do a single thing. She'd never cleaned a toilet. She'd never made a bed. She couldn't even chop up an apple. We ended up getting her to just sit and listen to the lectures because we couldn't afford a staff member to teach her. <laughs> she got angry. She got angry at her mother. She said to her mother, why didn't you teach me? And the mother said, I thought I was being a good mother. Do you know, when you do, ev you do everything for your baby, is that right? <laughs> and I know mothers find it hard, the transition from baby to little toddler. But I used to think, child, dirty plate, who should clean the plate? Child throws jacket on the ground, who should pick up the jacket? So it's very important to teach your child to work because then you've got time to play with them. And both are very important. My, my daughter has taught her seven children to work. They are workers. And the twin girls, they're 16, they're working two days a week now in a nursery. And the boss told them recently, he said, I wasn't going to employ you because I am sick of teenagers. Mm -hmm. He said, they don't come to work. They don't know how to work. They don't want to work. But he said, I needed some workers, so I thought I'd try you. He said, I have never met teenagers like you. Now, where did they learn to work? They learned to work here when they were little. When you deprive children of work, you deprive them of the joy of accomplishment. So please include them. And when you include them in the work in the home, then you've got time to play with them. And both are very, very important. So basically, it's a balance. All good things should be done in moderation. But there are some things that should never enter the human body if you're looking for optimum performance. And I consider the pure crystallized acid extracted from the sugarcane plant one of the most lethal substances. In his book, Pure White and Deadly, Dr. Yutkin, he claims it should be banned. It is so dangerous. How is it dangerous? It gets the blood sugar level up very high, very fast, and then the body... To cope with this sends a huge amount of insulin to get it out of the blood and into the cell. And now we're too low. And when the person's down there, what do they do? I have another bit of sugar, is that right? So you get this whiplash. And what's happening now, pancreases are wearing out far too soon. And then children are being born with weakened pancreases. There's really, the, the true pandemic on the planet is heart disease and diabetes, wouldn't you say so? That's, that's the true pandemic. They're, they're the number one killers. And it's sugar. I'm not referring to honey, maple syrup, the, the natural or the coconut sugars. I'm referring to the pure crystallized acid that's been extracted from the sugar cane plant. I thank God that there are many alternatives. But if someone has diabetes, they can't even take those natural sugars until the pancreas is strong. Hybridised wheat. In the 1950s, wheat went through the hybridisation process. What the scientists wanted, they wanted to create a plant with a high yield of grain to help with the starvation crisis. And they did. Remember wheat used to grow that high? Most people don't even, today don't even know that. 
In fact, we had a wheat farmer do our program. His parents are wheat farmers, he's 25. He was shocked when I said wheat used to grow that high. You see, at first, it still grew that high, but it was such a heavy yield of grain that the stalks broke before they could harvest it. So back to the drawing board, and they eventually came up with a wheat that only grows that high, has a thick stalk, and it can hold the heavy yield of grain. We had a man do our program and he said, my brother is a wheat farmer and he's in his 60s, late 60s, and he remembers the old wheat and he loves the new wheat. you know why? He can get six times more grain per acre. What's that? Six times more money per acre. No wonder they love it. But what was never addressed was the effect on the body. This wheat went through, went through intensive crossbreeding, but it bypassed the safety studies. Did you know that the COVID vaccine has totally bypassed all the safety studies? Mm -hmm. We've got to be cautious of things that don't go through safety studies. Right. What it created was a starch structure that gets the blood sugar level up higher than even sugar. Let me show you. This starch structure is called amylopectin A. And amylopectin A gets the blood sugar level up very high, very fast, then you've got a corresponding dump. Let me give you something to compare it to. Amylopectin B is found in bananas and potatoes, and if you're familiar with the glycemic index of food, that gets it up relatively high, relatively fast. So the B, so this is the A, What's the B? The B, the B is not quite as high, not quite as fast, not quite as low. And for the diabetic, they still want to keep away from the B. Amylopectin C is found in chickpeas or garbanzos, lima beans, black-eyed beans, lentils, all your legumes. So amylopectin C gets a nice steady rise. Sorry, I can't draw off the board or I'd be over there. There's your C. That's what every single cell in the body wants. It wants a steady, consistent, sure delivery of fuel. So let's have a look at the glycemic index of food, considering this. 55 is your baseline. So under 55 are your low GIs. So cherries. In fact, just about all your berries, they sit at 25, whereas grapefruit, it sits at, it sits at about 24. So people who want a nice low delivery of fuel, like your diabetics, they're, they're your better fruits. Where does sugar sit? Sugar sits at 59, whether it's white or tan or brown. Where does um, white bread, let's have a look at white bread. So that's your refined wheat. It sits at 69. Well, so your white bread will get the blood sugar level up higher than sugar. But what's a really shocker is whole wheat. So your whole wheat, it sits at 72. Now, how could that be? How could whole wheat get the blood sugar level up higher than white bread? Because it's not refined, it has more amylopectin A in it, and it's the amylopectin A that gets that blood sugar level up. One lady was talking to my husband, and he said, and she said, how come Barbara says white bread's better than wholemeal bread? He said, what? Of course, whole wheat bread has more fiber. Of course, it has more B vitamins. What I'm referring to here is the starch structure. And it was the hybridization process that did it. You still can get ancient grains. The original wheat was called Enkenhorn, and you can still get that. Spelt, Kamut. They're ancient grains. They haven't been hybridized, and so they haven't got this amylopectin A in them. If you want to pursue this a little bit more, there's an excellent book by um, Dr. Davis, William Davis. It's called Wheat Belly. And he gives a whole story of what happened to the wheat. He, he also quotes Dr. Norman Boulag, got, who got a Nobel Prize in the early 70s because of this hybridized wheat. And no one complains about wanting to 
<coughs> have more food to save the starvation crisis, but the safety studies were never done. And this explains the absolute explosion that we're seeing in diabetes today. And what are diabetics told to eat? Whole wheat bread, whole wheat pasta, whole wheat. <laughs> are they healing? No, they're not. They're not. So that explains so much. It's what they've done to the wheat. That's the problem. We're not talking about the original wheat. Caffeine. How many Americans woke up to these three this morning? The coffee and the muffin, the coffee and the croissant, the coffee and the toast, the coffee and the cereal. So what's the problem with caffeine? Let me show you. Our nervous system is made up of nerve cells and these nerve cells are different to other cells. These nerve cells make up our electrical system. These nerve cells communicate with each other via little chemical messengers. This is the nerve cell. What I'm drawing now is the arm coming out, the little boutons at the end of the filaments, and here is the next nerve cell. So our nervous system, and by the way, there are one trillion of these in our brain, they communicate with each other via little chemical messengers. Here's the little chemical messengers. They're coming in. They're encapsulated in the nucleus. They're sent down the arm into the little boutons and then they release out to the next nerve cell. Now that, those nerve cells with their little neurotransmitters, they can be communicating at two, anywhere between two and 200 miles an hour. In a crisis, they're, they're moving very fast. What caffeine does is it interferes with these neurotransmitters. So one is adenosine, and adenosine is a neurotransmitter that acts like the brakes. And when caffeine goes into the body, adenosine levels drop. You know what that means, brakes are failing. Our brain runs according to precision balance. So when the brakes start to fail, the body says, whoa, quick, we're lacking brakes. Develop extra receptor sites on every dendrite to grab every bit of adenosine that comes through. Then the person comes to Living Springs Retreat. We don't serve any coffee. <laughs> Adenosine levels go back to normal, receptor sites get flooded. Oh, does that hurt? That explains the pain and suffering we see in our guests that have been drinking coffee. We had one couple come, they're two girlfriends, they're in their 30s, and on the plane trip to our retreat, they decided to just get everything. Because they're going to a health retreat, they ate the chocolates and the Cokes and the coffees. Wow, those girls, they couldn't get out of bed for the first 24 hours. So if someone says to me, what can we do to prepare for the retreat? I say, stop the coffee. And that is actually too hard. So you know what I say? Ease off the coffee. The best way to do it is little by little by little. In the library here, there's a book called Caffeine Blues. And he's got a chapter called Coming Off the Bean. And he shows how you can do it without pain and suffering. He says every day just have a little less, a little less, a little less. Instead of having three cups of coffee a day, have three half cups of coffee a day, then, then a quarter, and then you just ease it out like that. The other neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that has to do with brain function and it rises when a person has a cup of coffee. Isn't that why people have coffee and work? Mm -hmm. Don't talk to me, I haven't had my coffee yet. Yeah. yeah. And the other one is dopamine. Dopamine is your pursuit of reward, pursuit of happiness hormone. It also rises with a cup of coffee. That's why you hear people say, oh, I love my coffee, just gets me going in the morning, makes me feel better, gets my brain going. Ah, oh, yes, that's the acetylcholine. Yes, that's the dopamine but you can't keep doing it. It's like taking out a loan to pay off your loan. What's the old saying? Robbing Peter to pay Paul. Eventually, your adrenal glands are exhausted. Eventually, you actually, it's not doing it anymore. So instead of three cups of coffee a day, there has to go to five cups of coffee a day. It's an addictive cycle. 
No wonder people have chronic fatigue syndrome. It's usually a result of <laughs> too much of the caffeine, too much of the stimulants. Headquarters, we're going to headquarters on Saturday morning. But these, these two, they disrupt the fuel supply to the brain and caffeine disrupts the chemical imbalance or the chemical balance in the brain causing an imbalance. And yet, isn't that the, the breakfast most Americans start with? No wonder teachers are having trouble with teaching kids in the school when, when this is the breakfast. Now we're going to look at the neurotoxins. One neurotoxin is mercury. A neurotoxin means brain poison. In fact, what it means is kills brain cells. And we've got to look after our brain cells, the ones we have now, we have for life. How can we be exposed to mercury? We can be exposed through fish. There's hardly a fish today that doesn't have some mercury in it because of all the chemicals and industry that's pumped into the sea. You can also be exposed to mercury by the silver coloured fillings in the mouth, those dark coloured fillings. One of the problems with mercury, apart from the fact that it is a neurotoxin, is that it accumulates. It's called bioaccumulative. The bigger the fish, the higher the concentration of mercury. The longer the mercury fillings in the mouth, the more it is accumulating in the tissues. The third place is the, the vaccines. In 1998, they banned mercury from the childhood vaccination because of the clear, proven link between autism and the mercury in the vaccines. So the mercury isn't in the childhood vaccines anymore, but it still is in the flu vaccine, which means it's quite possibly in the COVID vaccine. It's a neurotoxin. There is no safe dose of mercury. You can't play with this stuff. But what you can do is you can take steps to make sure it does not come into your body. Alcohol is also a neurotoxin and there is no safe dose of alcohol. That's a statement from the Australian Health Department 10 years ago. There is no safe dose of alcohol. You have in your history in America the prohibition. That's 1920 to 1933. America did well in those years. The Mental institution occupancies dropped to 8%. Domestic violence almost wiped down, all because alcohol had stopped. Alcohol is a neurotoxin. There is no safe dose of it. Tobacco, there are 4,000 chemicals in cigarettes today. There is no safe dose of, of, of tobacco. We have a, a wood fire in our home, which is very nice in the winter, but you know what we've got to do every couple of years is clean that chimney out. Well, that's what's happening in the chimneys of smokers, which is all these little bronchials here. If I say to someone, your, your father or your mother, are they still alive? No. Uh, how did they die? Lung cancer? What's my next question? Did they smoke? Almost without exception, about 99.8%, yes, they are a smoker. In Australia, I don't know in America, but there are really graphic pictures on every cigarette packet. I don't know if you have that. There's diseased lungs, there's gangrene toes, there's <laughs> trying to get the message that this is toxic. Please don't do it. Drugs? Drugs never cure disease. They just change the form and location of the disease. There are some drugs that cannot be stepped immediately. There are some drugs that can be stopped immediately. There are drugs that need to be eased off. I believe that it is our responsibility to prove to our doctor that we can conquer our ailments naturally. I love surprising the doctor, yeah? yeah. <laughs> and we've seen many people get back to us and say, my doctor is astonished because I'm managing my problem with, without the medication. Yes, drugs can save a life in a crisis. We're not talking about a crisis. We're talking about day-to-day -day lives. MSG, monosodium glutinate. Monosodium glutinate causes the nerve cells on the tongue to overfire. And when the nerve cells on the tongue overfire, these nerve cells get exhausted and can even die. If monosodium glutinate is on a food, 
it excites the nerve cells on the tongue and so the food tastes fantastic. That's a worry, isn't it? You know what that means? Rotten food, bad food would taste good. Now be careful because monosodium glutinate has a few other names today. Natural flavour enhancer, that almost sounds healthy, doesn't it? So please become label readers. Find out what is in your food. Your handbag or your man bag needs, probably needs a magnifying glass in it because it's that real small print that's hard to read. Whereas you don't even have to read it when you're in the fruits and vegetables section, is that right? So your fruits and veggies. But what you do have to go for is your organics. And I notice here in America, it's very easy to buy organics. You know, Costco and uh, you've got Trader Joe's, there's big organic sections. Chemicals, we need to get the chemicals out of our homes, out of our toothpaste, out of our washing detergent, out of our clothes. We need to get the chemicals out of the home. So clean with white vinegar. Remember what bleach will do? It will kill mould, but it will feed fungus. And putting bleach on mould, you create one of the most toxic combinations on the planet. So clean areas with white vinegar, also sodium bicarbonate. And if you've got a particularly tough area to clean, you can put a little pile of sodium bicarbonate, pour a little bit of vinegar there and you'll get a fizzing up, you get a nice reaction and get the scrubbing brush into that area. I think most people are well aware, you clean every week. <laughs> I know when I first became a Seventh-day Adventist at the age of 25, I loved the Sabbath message because then every Friday my house got a big clean. <laughs> and before I became a Christian, it was sort of when I thought of it. But I wanted to have my house all clean, all my washing done, because it's hard to have a Sabbath rest if you've got a pile of laundry or you, you've got a dirty bathroom. So it certainly made me a better housekeeper because every week I, I had my house all nice and clean. When you keep things clean, you don't have to resort to the chemicals. And when you become a vegetarian and you're, you're cooking in the oven, you don't get that fat buildup that you get with uh, cooking, cooking meat. So it's a lot easier to clean. But be mindful of your cleaning products. Also, we're talking about leaving a nice smell. Sodium bicarbonate and vinegar don't leave a nice smell. That's where your essential oils and I think it's tonight that Vanessa will be talking to you about your essential oils. There are some beautiful essential oils that you can use, not only to give a nice scent, but especially your clove and your thyme and your oregano, they, they really push back the, the, the growth of mould. And of course, I'm Australian. I love the eucalyptus. The eucalyptus oil smells very nice too. So have a look at alternatives to your chemicals. Also mould, there should be no mould in the house at all. If there is, don't allow yourself to be exposed. That's a good time for a mask. <laughs> That's a good time to have your body well clothed. Don't, don't allow any mould to get into your body. It'll go in through your skin, you can breathe it in, so please protect yourself. If there is mould in your house, you've got to get the builder or you've got to get the plumber. You've got to find out why it is there. Is it that big tree that's over the house? Is it because the gutters need to be cleaned? You've got to find out why, why it is there. Also, electromagnetic field excess. Please take steps to have an electromagnetic free electromagnetic field free bedroom. Remember, we spend a third of our life in there. So have your, have your phones or your iPads, computers charging in another room. Also be very cautious with the children. If you, children in your home are used to a lot of technology, start easing it off. Start easing it back, easing it back. And remember the Russian guidelines. In fact, here's a good one. Two minutes for the two-year-old. <laughs> Five minutes for the five-year-old, 10 minutes for the 10-year-old. By the 15, yeah, it can become an hour. By the 18-year-old, maybe three hours. 
So be very cautious of children's exposure to technology. We've got to protect the next generation from the chemicals, from the electromagnetic field danger. It's a very socially acceptable list, isn't it? There's no need for me to talk to you about the dangers of methamphetamines, of morphine, of heroin, of cyanide, or arsenic, but there, I think that's fairly obvious to most, but there is a definite need for people to become aware of the danger of this very socially acceptable list. And little by little, like the dripping tap on a stone, they're eating away at body functions and contributing to the demise and disease of so many human beings. And that's why temperance is an important law of health. We're going to have a break now. And after the break, we will come back and we'll look, visit Dr. Sunshine.